standing observe. Ready when you are, April. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this, the third in a series of webinars uh, in commemoration of International Coastal Cleanup Day. Of course, that day would have happened the third Saturday in September, but because of the COVID-19 pandemic and the restrictions which were in place at the time, the usual events were postponed. But here at the National Environment and Planning Agency, we have collaborated with our partners to continue the sensitization, though we may not physically together, we are certainly online sharing information. And so our first was a series through our Nepal Connects Instagram page, where we hosted Professor Mona Weber and Colin Jack from Trinidad and Tobago, where they looked at issues relating to coast, coastal pollution and what was being done in between Jamaica and Trinidad and Tobago. Last week, Friday, we were here with you on our YouTube channel where we engaged you. And that, at that time, we looked at sarcasm and we looked at what was happening in our Caribbean region. So this week, we are continuing the series on conversations and we have a fabulous lineup for you. Today with us is our own Professor Mona Weber. She joins us again. And of course, by now you would have known that Professor Mona Weber, she's a marine biologist here at the University of the West Indies. She has done extensive research on coastal water quality using plankton and microplastics, as well as sargasm. She's also the current chair of the Environmental Management, the James S. Moss Solomon, Chair in Environmental Management at the University of the West Indies. And our second guest who we will hear from is an avian expert. What does the word avian means? Yes, he looks at birds and he is Donovan Brandon Hay. He works with the Caribbean Coastal Air Management Foundation and he's also a scientific officer there while he manages some significant sanctuaries. Yes, the Portland Bight Protected Area Sanctuaries. So we're looking forward to the conversation with our guest today. But first, we would like to have a word from our minister. And he is none other than the Honorable Pernell Charles Jr. We will hear the message which he gave us for International Coastal Cleanup Day. He is the Minister of Housing, Urban Renewal, Environment and Climate Change. International Coastal Cleanup Day is again being observed while we're grappling with this COVID-19 pandemic. A pandemic that has asked us to wear masks as protective measures. Many of these masks have plastic. Plastic that may take up to 450 years to decompose. When we do the math, we're going to have at least or more than 300 million masks per year in Jamaica. And unfortunately, many of those are improperly disposed in our gullies, waterways, on our street, through the window. So we don't need to add to the problem, the large problem that we already have with plastic litter. That's why on this International Coastal Cleanup Day, I want to ask you, I want to encourage you, bag it, bin it, keep Jamaica clean. It's our island. One love. There you have it, one love from our Minister of Housing, Urban Renewal, Environment and Climate Change, Honorable Pernell Charles Jr.
Ladies and gentlemen, we have persons joining us on YouTube. Of course, we're looking forward to an interactive morning. Uh, we have lots to hear from our guests. And at this time, I'm going to invite them to turn on their cameras so they can join us for this conversation. Of course, we are coming to you live on the NEPA Jamaica YouTube channel, and we will also share the information on our Facebook channel. So we look forward to hearing your comments and your questions and interactive sessions. First, let me go over to Professor Mona Weber. Welcome back, Professor Weber. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm gonna invite you to share screen with our audience. Fantastic. Yes, we are seeing you and she'll speak to us on plastics and microplastics, their impact on marine species. And this is so timely because tomorrow, Saturday, October 9, will be commemorated as World Migratory Bird Day. Over to you, Professor Mona Weber. Thank you so much. I am very happy to be invited to share, and I was asked to speak about microplastics. It's very difficult to speak about microplastics without, without talking about plastics, because the, we, we, we have a microplastics problem because we have a plastics problem. So what are microplastics? They are really fragments, small fragments of plastic, less than five millimeter in any dimension, and they are created usually when plastics remain in the environment and they're acted on by the sun and, and water movement, wave action or rivers, and they fragment. They break up into smaller and smaller pieces of plastic. There are other microplastics that are actually created small. Those are called my primary microplastics. So like the, the microbeads in cosmetics and so on. But oh, the majority of what we see in our environment are the secondary microplastics that come from weathered and, and fragmented plastics. So plastics, you've been hearing about for a long time, but I just thought I'd remind that it, it's, a, it's a synthetic product made from petroleum um, and the, the polyethylene and polystyrene those we're very familiar with, the, the polystyrene expanded, polystyrene is foam, um, PVC, nylon, nylon clothing, that, that is grouped under the, the, the terminology plastics. And so the material has a petroleum origin, which, which makes it um, toxic. And it usually is mixed with additives things to, to, to make it flexible, things to stabilize it, and, and therefore it, it lasts for a very long time. You heard ministers' um, comments, 450 years, a minimum of 450 years to biodegrade or to degrade. And so we, we have an abundance of plastics in our environment, so much so that we are, recognizing a new historical epoch, the Plasticine. You're actually seeing layers of plastic in our, in our, in our strata in, on the earth. And many of these are in the form of microplastics. In 2015, the, the plastic in the ocean was 3% microplastics by weight. By 2018, 50% of the plastics in the ocean were microplastics. And in 2021, at a, at a workshop I was at, we are being told that it is more now like 99%. So the plastics are remaining in our environment. The microplastics we are finding are mostly from fragments. And, and this has to do with plastic waste that is, that is broken down, improperly discarded and, and breaking down in the environment. And so the, the ratios of microplastics you get in different areas really is a reflection of the, of the type of waste and the type of waste issues that we have in, in these areas. I'll come back to that. So 
fragments of plastic, bear that in mind. We have a problem that we observe for the, for, through our international coastal cleanup activities. Over many years, international coastal cleanup global activities have they've been collecting data. And by 2017, they observed that this was the first year that the top 10 most commonly collected items were made of plastic. And the, that has not changed. I have here the 2019 data. Cigarette butts have a plastic filter in them, which is why they feature here. But we continue to have the top 10 most commonly collected items of our beaches being made of, of plastic. And we're not alone. The, the Caribbean, you should be aware, we are listed among the top 10 per capita plastic polluters in the world. Forbes has a list of 30 global plastic polluters and 10 are from the Caribbean. These are the 10. We produce our neighbors, us and our neighbors produce, the highest is 1.5 kilograms of plastic per person per day. So when you look at it per capita, it is, it is quite alarming. Jamaica isn't on this list because of our population size. But when we look again at our International Coastal Cleanup Day statistics, in 2019, we collected almost 800,000 garbage items, and that was the highest in the region, the highest in the Caribbean. Only Puerto Rico and Domrep came close. And of course, 90% of this material was made from plastic. Recycle Partners of Jamaica have tried to inform us as to how much plastic we are producing and using over 800 million PET and, and high density polyethylene bottles are, are, are used and 80% of these are improperly discarded. So we, we have a real plastic problem and the impacts of plastic across the globe, these have been highlighted for many years and they my colleague, Brandon, will speak on what it does to birds, to seabirds, and, and, and all over the, the, the globe, we have seen these graphic pictures of marine animals being entangled and, and trapped and killed by plastics. But plastics also contribute to the spread of invasive species. They, they use the plastics as, as, as rafts. Um, coral diseases have been linked. Research has shown incidence of coral diseases increasing with plastics in the water. And as plastics degrade, they produce methane and ethylene. These are climate relevant gases. These, these are greenhouse gases. So we, we, we know the issues that we have with plastics and we focus a lot on the animals, but my colleague, Dr. Trench, would, would want to put in here that we should also focus on how the plants are being impacted by, by plastics. His research through restoration activities along the Palisados has shown up to 60% seeding loss when the plastics are, are, are able to smother, are able to get to the new seedlings. Again, research out of the Discovery Bay Marine Lab by Dr. Trench and his team have shown that the plastic bags in particular are damaging to the, to the young mangrove seedlings. So this, this really affects our restoration efforts. And plastics, the impact of plastics is also seen on our forests or established forests, not seedlings now. And Refuge Key, you've heard about Refuge Key for a long time, but it's, it's still our best example of how plastics and the buildup of this material in the forest can damage, can result in the loss of, of mangrove forests. This key, this key sorry, was, was cleaned in 2018 and over 8,000 bags of garbage of primarily plastics removed and the proof that the, the, the issue with plastics is real 
This, this is what refuge key looked like before. Now in, in 2000, I think it was 19, the, the key looked like this. And a team was on refuge key last week. And the, the key is, is literally greening. The plastics are coming back because we haven't fixed the problem. The plastics are coming back to refuge key, but the, the, the compaction and the, and the establishment of a berm that was pre preventing the, the water from flowing on and off the key, that issue has been solved. And the forest is regenerating with very little intervention after that on our part, um, but it illustrates the impact that the, the plastics will have on our established forests. So we all over Kingston Harbor, I mean, these are horrific pictures. Hunts Bay and, and main parts of the poor royal mangroves. And when you look closely at the forest floor, you're seeing tiny fragments of plastics. So the plastic remains and it, it breaks up into tiny fragments. And these cannot be removed. The, the, the larger items can be cleaned by, by efforts from our citizens but these fragments are impossible to pick up. So we, we have been noticing an MGI through a Kingston Harbor ecosystem adaptation um, project. We have been categorizing the, the quality of the mangroves in Kingston Harbor. We have done transects to show the health of the mangroves and we're relating that to the percentage cover of plastics. On the, on the forest floor. We're hoping to see some improvement in the plastic issue, and we will go out again and, and hopefully see improved health in the mangroves. But these indices and baselines help us to, to know the effectiveness of our, of our interventions. So the, the, the fuss about plastic, why, why are we making such a big deal about this extremely common and, and useful material. It's made from chemicals and, and the chemicals are toxic. And further, when the plastic remains in the environment, it ab absorbs other, other chemicals. And so it will take up other toxins. Studies have shown that plastics that remain in the environment have more of a toxic effect on species than, than virgin plastic. And these, these issues are, are alarming. The plastics will pick up lead and cadmium and mercury. And, and these, can be, these are very carcinogenic um, substances. There are endocrine disruptors and metabolic chemicals that will cause metabolic disorders leading to obesity and reduced fertility. These are not chemicals that we should be getting into our environment, into our food and into ourselves. And, and these are typical signs that we have for the plastics that we use every day. Biohazards because of the materials that they contain. So one of these very important material is, is biphenol A. And I thought you, you cannot, have a talk without emphasizing, you must look for BPA-free plastics. Because again, these are, this is one of the toxic substances that we need to avoid. So imagine these large fragments of plastic and they are break, they're staying in our environment and they are breaking up into microplastics. And this has been, has been called the new threat, um, but it is, it is no longer new. And the problem with microplastics, aside from being so small that you can't pick them back up easily, they are now far more labile. They, they, they get into the water column, they get into the sediments. And so when they're in the water column, they are mistakenly fed on by our plankton. And of course, the, the plankton are eaten by fish. When they are in the sediment, they are fed on by what we call deposit feeders. 
animals that eat sediment and take the organic substances. So all these bits of plastic in our water and in our sediments are being taken up by, by the animals. And we, we recognize bioaccumulation. They eat a lot of these little fragments and they, the toxins therefore accumulate in their tissues. So we have the potential to contaminate the food chain and the food web. And, and this, is, this is actually happening already. And therefore, when we eat the, the animals from our environment, we get these plastics and these toxins into our cells. There is now a lot of research. I know this graphic looks very busy, but it is really saying um, microplastic exposure has been now recorded to affect the nervous system in humans, the respiratory system, the renal system, the kidneys, and the digestive and reproductive and, and so on systems. And so when you have such small fragments, they are able to move throughout our environment and into us far more easily. So microplastics are in organisms that we have. All over the world, yes, but also in our sea cucumbers, in our shrimp, in, in our marine organisms. And, and one interesting effect that we should be concerned about, because it compromises the animal's body, you tend to have smaller body sizes, and this, of course, will have an impact on our fisheries. So we decided to determine how much microplastics we had in our waters. And in 2017, the department conducted a study um, in the mangroves, with a mantle trawl, a special device from five jars. And we were able to um, identify, count, measure. And these are the photographs of the microplastic fragments we found in, in our waters. We had over 2 million, almost 3 million fragments per kilometer square, especially near Refuge Key, as you would expect. And, and near Buccaneer Beach, um, Gunboat Beach. And the categories were primarily fragments. This blue area of the pie is 86.75% of our catch was fragments. We had very little in the way of fibers and microbeads and so on. And this is a direct result of the kind of waste and the fragments, when we did the, the, the analysis, they were dominated by polyethylene and polypropylene. So these, this reflects our, our bottles and plastic bags and so on that are fragmenting and entering our water column. We had a high microplastic to zooplankton ratio, which means the fish will encounter microplastics as much as they encounter the plankton that they feed on. So we, we, we have a, a, a problem. We have microplastics in our waters and we, sorry, and we are aware that our fishers use the, the mangrove, they collect oysters, they collect fish. And while we got an unclean fish, we, we eat the oysters, essentially the whole animals. So, we need to know what is in the food we're collecting. A student is now working on some of that. We have a, a new student, MPhil student, looking at the, the, a more complex spread of microplastics um, um, in the environment. So in the, in the plankton, from the water column, in the sediments, and of course in the oysters. So we're hoping to have some numbers and, and, and a link between the, the different areas of the environment where we find the microplastics. So we, we, need, we need to move very quickly. We need to turn off the plastic tap and, and it has to involve everybody. We're not just talking about the people who discard their, their plastics carelessly. We're talking about the, the people who produce items in plastic. We're talking about our waste management system. It, it has to, to involve everyone. And we need to remove the plastics that are already in the environment. 
because once they begin to fragment into these microplastic pieces, you can't take them out again. It's impossible to remove. We at the university, we will continue to do the research. Research is important. We've done a lot of research. You can't, you, you have to appreciate the importance of having the data to inform policy, to help educate the population. And even very important for me to, to confirm the effectiveness of our, of our interventions. We need technology, we need trained persons, and we, we need to be able to study our system more effectively so that we can properly indicate the threats and, and properly inform our population. So we, we need all hands on deck and we have to move to solve this plastic problem. Thank you. Certainly that was a lot of food for thought for us. It is alarming that as small island states, we produce such a large amount of plastics within the Caribbean. It's almost embarrassing to learn that here on our island of Jamaica, we were responsible for the largest amount of solid waste collected at our International Coastal Cleanup Day. We learned quite a bit from Professor uh, we learned about her pro project, the Kingston Harbor Adaptation Project. We also learned what we can do. As residents, we have an individual responsibility. If each day we are producing 1.5 kilogram per person, it means that we need to take a personal responsibility in reducing the amount of waste. I know the government of Jamaica, we have started certainly in 2018, September 2018, we passed a ban on single-use plastic bags here in Jamaica. And there are several orders which are currently in place with significant fines, some amounting for $2 million for the Trade Act, the Trade in Plastic Packaging Material Order. And the fines for those is $2 million, as well as $50,000 for the NRC Act, but certainly much more ought to be done. And I'm sure at the National Environment and Planning Agency, we are pressing forward as well. And Jamaicans, we ought to know there's an imprisonment time for this, you know, all the way of two years. Certain persons don't have two years of their productive life to give away because we are not disposing of our solid waste and we're we're purchasing and trading in packaging materials such as single-use plastic bags. So we learned about the human impact. We learned from Professor how the, the, plas the plastics have uh, broken down into microplastics and how it's making its way into the food chain for those of us who are seafood lovers, those of us who like our shrimp and oysters, Certainly, it's not good news for us this morning. Let's find out what's happening with our animals. And at this time, I am going to call on Donovan Brandon. He asking him, yes, he has turned on his camera and he will share screen with us shortly as he shares with us what's happening in terms of our marine species, specifically our water birds. Over to you, Mr. Hay. Okay, can you hear me? <clears throat> Loud and clear. Okay. All right, so um, morning, everybody. I am going to um, unfortunately have to recap some of what Professor Weber has already said, just for, um, to uh, refresh our minds and, to, and for clarity. And, um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit more specifically about what I have seen in relation to our water birds in particular, and how plastics have been interfering with, with them. All right, so again, to recap, what are these microplastics? They're basically these small pieces of plastic, which is less than five millimeters in length, and they end up in our environment as a result of the disposal and breakdown of these synthetic plastic 
products, consumer products and industrial waste as well. And as uh, Professor Weber mentioned, uh, typically majority of the microplastics in our environment were, was once part of the macroplastics um, regime where they, they were once much larger pieces of plastic that have been broken down into smaller and smaller pieces. That's because when plastic waste ends up in the environment, it does not degrade in the way that natural materials do. Instead, it continually disintegrates. So it doesn't degrade, but it, it just breaks up into ever smaller pieces. Um, so why are they here? Um, as Professor Weber said, they've been accumulating in our environment shortly after plastics themselves were invented. The age of modern plastics began in about 1907 with the invention of Bakelite. And um, since then, much of the plastics that we have produced are in some form still out there in our environment. Uh, reason for this is that it takes so much energy to break down the constituent components of the plastics. Most plastics are polymers and um, it takes a lot of energy to break them down. Usually it involves incineration. And of course that is a double-edged sword in and of itself because when you incinerate plastics, you tend to create byproducts that are themselves often highly toxic. So the plastics themselves are toxic. Um, and if you incinerate them in order to, to try and as a means of getting rid of them, you can often end up with even more toxic byproducts. Um, and so, as I, as I said, nearly all of the plastic waste that we've ever generated is still in the environment. And although they mentioned um, that it could take a minimum of 450 years, there are many others that will take a thousand years or even more. So, you know, 450 may be a minimum, a thousand or multiples of that are, is more typical. So where are they now? Basically they're everywhere. Scientists have found microplastics everywhere that they have looked. They're in the deep ocean, they're in Arctic snow and Arctic ice. They're in shellfish, table salt, drinking water, and even beer. They're drifting in the air. And of course, once they start drifting, they'll end up falling in the rain, both in city and developed areas, as well as in um, previously pristine mountain and wilderness areas. And because their use is so ubiquitous all over the planet, and they are so mobile, especially once they become, um, they become very small, they accumulate um, most commonly in the marine environment in particular. Um, you know, they, they may get on the land, but as they break down, they get carried in the water cycle and often end up in the sea. What's the problem? Well, here are some of the problems. Aquatic birds are most affected as they often mistakenly ingest plastic with or as food. Larger pieces of plastic, um, of course, they can't, they're so hardy that they can't break down the way that normal food would. And so they often accumulate and are unable to expel these larger pieces of plastics. And so they remain in the, in the intestines and the gastrointestinal tract, and they can cause physical obstructions, which will prevent food items from passing through. But they can also, because of their you know, sharp edges, can create perforations that can lead to mortality in a lot of, um, of our seabirds in particular. So initially they can cause poor absorption, which can lead to starvation, or they can actually perforate the, the intestine and that itself can cause, cause um, mortality in our seabirds. And so it's ingesting plastics is, is something that has been growing. And unfortunately, a lot of seabirds find the colorful bits of plastic in the sea irresistible. Um, and once they've swallowed them, usually they remain in their intestines until um, and accumulate until the worst happens. They're also, the microplastic side of things, as Professor River mentioned, they're also small enough to be ingested by the other things that the birds feed on, like the shellfish and the plankton. And in this case, the toxic chemicals that are in the plastics at that time, then make their way through the food chain into the blood of seabirds. 
And um, that contributes to endocrine effects, meaning um, affecting the hormone balance, uh, affecting their immune systems, it's suppressing their immune systems in a way that make them much more susceptible to diseases um, and other pathogens. Um, they have carcinogenic effects both in, in uh, humans as well as in the wildlife that they uh, collect in. And so a lot of birds and wildlife um, have been developing mysterious tumors and cancers of all kinds that were not common in the past. And the overall effect on, on birds, even if they, they don't necessarily kill them, they tend to have a developmental impacts. They, they retard their development and often create defects in, in the eggs and shell development. And also in the, uh, as I said before, the strength of their immune response. So what about Jamaica? As we know, they're ubiquitous in Jamaica almost every year of our lives. But we have very, very limited capacity to reuse and recycle these materials. And so mostly plastics um, make up the growing, the largest and growing part of our waste stream generated here in Jamaica. Of course, on January 1st in 2019, the plastic ban became, came into effect. And so we are attempting to address the problem at the source by trying to reduce the amount of plastics that, that um, end up in the waste stream um, as a result of single use and packaging problems. Other problem with, with birds in particular, um, you would have seen photographs and, 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 um, and videos on television showing birds that have become entangled in all kinds of plastic, old nets, monofil monofilament fishing lines, and so on. And this is actually more common than you might think. In fact, I can, from my own experience, recall that I have rarely ever visited um, a seabird colony in Portland by it and not seen at least one bird that has some monofilament line attached to it in some way. Um, and quite often you will see one or more birds that have died, usually from, from starvation because they've become entangled in monofilament that, that uh, readily entangles in their feathers and then entangles in the trees when they alight on the trees and that sort of imprisons them and, and prevents them from, from leaving and they stay there until they eventually starve and die. And this is, it, it's a particular problem with birds because um, monofilament line has an affinity for feathers. The, the structure of the feathers is such that um, it can often take just the mere contact with monofilament line, especially in, in, in the presence of moisture, for it to become um, entangled within the, 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 the fibers, the monofilament. And once that happens, especially if it happens with flight feathers, it's very, very difficult for the bird to free itself. Um, you may think, well, all they have to do is, is pull away and, 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 and remove the feathers. But especially when multiple feathers become involved, the more the bird struggles, the more feathers become involved and it becomes impossible in a very short time for, for birds to escape. So um, this fact is actually utilized by, by um, many of our um, fish farmers in Jamaica and around the world. May, anybody who has ever visited a fish farm will may have seen um, monofilament fishing lines being strung out across the, the, the ponds. And you may wonder, well, how does a single line every five feet help to protect the pond from diving birds that may be coming in to fish? And that, as I explained, is simply because these feathers have such an affinity for the monofilament line that sometimes it only takes a casual contact for them to start to become entangled. And then once the bird struggles, they become more and more entangled. And then unless someone comes and frees them, they're going to have to remain there until they end up dying of starvation. And so um, in the natural environment, old fishing line is a major, major problem. But of course, the birds often ingest the plastics uh, and then become unable to feed. They find these colorful little bits irresistible. 
Um, and of course, one of the things we've also noticed is that birds tend to line their nests with these pieces of plastic. For whatever reason, we be, you know, in natural environments, birds tend, seabirds in particular, especially those that nest on the ground, their eggs could be particularly vulnerable because you could easily see these white eggs or mottled eggs sitting in an open nest. However, what they often do is they will line the nest with fragments of coral and shell to sort of disguise the presence of the, the egg itself in the nest. And of course, um, with our amount of plastic in the environment and the bright colors, the birds are, are in some cases preferring to use pieces of plastic in their nest. And as such, um, there are very few nests in many of the colonies that do not have even one piece of plastic netting or a, a bottle stopper or some other kind of plastic, which you can imagine could easily be ingested by a chick. And so this is a, a major problem. Not only could it be ingested, but it could entangle the chick and cause them to, to also to, to suffocate or to starve to death, be unable to feed. Um, and also the nesting habitat itself is damaged. The, the, the plastics, which can be very mobile, will smother the nest and, and uh, destroy them. But they will also, as Professor Weber mentioned, damage the trees within which many of the seabirds will then nest. So if there are no trees, the, those seabirds that prefer to nest in trees will lose the habitat, the mangrove habitat that they depend on to, to lay their nest, to make their nest. So as I said before, in our rivers and in the sea, the hazard to our birds is obvious. The problem is severe and it is everywhere. But I wanted to sort of focus um, the discussion on two particular areas, um, Pedro Key seabird colonies, and of course, the Refuge Key seabird colony. And um, this is because these two areas are the largest single they host the largest single colonies of seabirds that we have left in Jamaica. And in these areas, the plastic problem is particularly acute. Um, of course, because they're in the marine environment, there's a lot of plastics that is being accumulated there. But for other reasons, as, as we will look into, the, the plastics are a problem. So out on the Pedro Keys. The Pedro Keys are three small islands and they're about 80 kilometers or so southwest of the mainland of Jamaica. And um, the two of the three main islands are inhabited by fishermen um, who operate out on the bank. And the third, which is the largest of the three islands is actually an unofficial wildlife sanctuary. There is a, a fish sanctuary surrounding the, that um, key, which is known as Southwest Key. But the majority of the island is, is uninhabited and as such, this is the, the key here, if you can see my cursor. Um, and as you can see, there are no residents, there's nobody on this key. And there are hundreds, um, if not thousands of birds nesting on this key, up to 10 different species of um, seabirds are known to breed in the, on this island and on the other islands. But if you look at the top image, you will notice that um, this, these birds are nesting in the middle of garbage. This is not on Southwest Key, but this is on Middle Key, where the majority of fishermen live. And there is no solid waste collection. And so plastic is a major problem. Um, it accumulates in huge piles on the island. And um, there have been attempts to try to remove the garbage um, on occasion, but it very quickly accumulates again, especially you can imagine there are people out there who are living in very um, primitive conditions. And so a lot of their food items have to be very well packaged. And so plastic packaging is an important safety measure that they utilize. All of their food and drinks have to be well protected in that environment. And so they generate, I believe, more than the typical amount of plastic waste out there. And that waste accumulates in huge piles in very short order. And because they're unable to remove the waste fast enough, they quite often set fire to these plastics. And as I mentioned before, that 
has the, the, the unfortunate side effect of creating large amounts of uh, toxic byproducts, which are leaching into the sand and making their way into the marine environment surrounding the, these keys. And at this point, we have done no research on the presence of any toxic byproducts in the waters around the key, despite the fact that um, these the, um, marine products from the Pedro Bank are ex exported and are a significant foreign exchange earner for Jamaica. We simply don't know exactly what is happening with the plastic residues because these fires are burning almost continuously. Um, most of the times there's at least one fire going and it smothers and burns for hours on end. And the birds are trying to nest in and amongst this waste and they are covered in soot sometimes, especially the chicks that are not very mobile and not able to, to go off in the, in the daytime to feed and to, and to cleanse themselves in the sea. And so they often get covered in soot and they're sitting there inhaling all of this, this toxic soot from plastic fires that surround them. And so it's a major problem, especially because on Middle Key uh, and on Southwest Key, the mass boobies, which are these black and white birds that you see in the photograph here above and, and also below, the, the Pedro, the colonies on the Pedro Keys are probably the largest um, of their kind anywhere in the Caribbean region for this particular species, which is um, considered to be a species of concern. And in fact, our species, our particular population may be a separate um, and endemic to, to this region, to Jamaica. And so it's a very, very important population of, of mass boobies, not to mention the other nine species that breed there, some of them seasonally. The, the boobies themselves are there year round. And so um, they, they tend to they have a peak nesting season, but they also um, roost and, and breed year round. And so there is a, there's always some uh, nesting activity taking place there in the middle of all of this mess. And the chicks, of course, quite often um, consume the plastic. They get entangled in the plastic. And um, especially because the parents, again, often use bits of plastics to line the nest. And so it's a real problem. We, we know for a fact that the, the colonies out at the Pedro Bank um, are significantly lower, probably less than 10% of their historic numbers, meaning um, maybe a few thousand, four or 5,000 of some of the more abundant nesting species like uh, sooty terns would be nesting there nowadays. And in some years we find that when we visit that we can record almost complete um, nest failure of the colony for that particular year. And so there's a lot happening with the colony out at Pedro and we're not understanding precisely what is happening. You know, there could be many contributing factors to to why the, the colony is a shadow of its former self and why it may, it appears to, to, to be in particular jeopardy because the productivity rate is, is very, very low and probably declining. As I said, we have major nest failures year on year. Um, but, you know, we're not able to, to study this. It's, it's so remote and it's, it's far away. We do not have the data to understand what is happening. But even without a detailed study, we can conclude from the photographs I've shown you that the plastics must be a major contributing factor to the uh, mortality that's taking place in the colonies out there. And going back to refuge key, again, as Professor Mona Weber mentioned earlier, refuge key is an important mangrove, it's part of the Palisades Port Royal Protected Area, but it is also probably the, la well, in fact, it's the largest seabird nesting colony on the mainland. And um, the key, as she would have explained, is in severe decline, or was in severe decline. And the pictures below illustrate why that is. This picture, um, I took this picture maybe uh, three years ago, and this was what it looked like. 
And um, of course, there's been a cleanup since and some recovery. But despite that, the plastic is still making its way into the harbor. And if it doesn't end up on refuge key, it's going to end up on some other beach around the coastline. Much of the, the, the waterways that lead into Kingston Harbor, especially when we have heavy rains, will transport vast amounts of plastic waste into the harbor, which doesn't disappear. It, much of it will float for a while and end up being taken with longshore currents to all of the beaches, particularly along the south coast and into the Portland Bight protected area, just to the west of Kingston Harbor. And so there are some beaches in Portland Bight that have very, very high levels of plastics. Um, and these beaches are not visited. And some of them, there are no, um, there's no access or easy access from land because they are surrounded by forests and mangrove forests. And the only way to access these beaches is by sea. And yet they have as much or more plastic waste than many of the beaches where people regularly go to, to swim. And so this is a major problem and it's growing and um, it doesn't really matter. It's not people going to the beach to deposit the, the trash. It's the trash that's being transported in our waterways that's ending up on the beaches and in the mangrove roots and killing the mangroves and also killing the birds themselves and also destroying the habitat that they depend on to breed. So um, just quickly, as um, Eva mentioned, what can we do? Well, we all need to reduce our consumption of plastic, especially the single use packaging. Even with the ban that we currently have, there are lots of of ways in which plastics are still being used to, to protect our food and, and, um, and the items that we purchase that are wholly unnecessary, especially for items, for non-food items where you really don't need a lot of packaging, um, plastic packaging to, to protect them from the environment since they're not subject to the kind of spoilage. And so we need to be more conscious about the waste that we generate and ensure that what waste we do generate is properly disposed of. Um, we need to think about what we are buying and use our purchasing power to support those products that use biodegradable packaging or components. You know, a lot of times um, these, these products can be slightly more expensive. However, if you think of the cost of cleanup of the non-degradable things and the cost to the environment and the cost to our health, and the health of the environment in the long term, they are in fact much cheaper, but it requires us as consumers to, to make the choice to go for biodegradable components whenever it's possible, whenever it's available. And of course, practice recycling to the extent that we can, can um, it's available to us. And of course, um, government initiatives like, for instance, the plastic ban, there has been a lot of pushback in some circles, people have been resistant to, to it. Uh, I've seen it as victimization of, of some sectors and, and so on. But the fact is the cost to the country and to our wildlife of these plastics in the environment is tremendously high. And it's a cost that we can ill afford to pay. And so um, we need to support and encourage government to, to pursue even stronger efforts to reduce the amount of plastics and to establish much more recycling so that much of the waste is removed from the environment at a stage before it gets to the microplastics where we can no longer remove it from the environment. And of course, finally, supporting local initiatives to clean up the environment, such as coastal cleanup days, um, beach cleanups in your area. And uh, that's about all I wanted to, to say. Thank you very much for your attention. Eva, are there any questions? There are questions. You both, Professor Mona Weber and yourself, Brandon, have, prof have provided much food for thought. And I'm, I'm happy to see the turnout. We have a good mixture of guests with us today. We have our fisher folk. I'm seeing our representatives from over there in Old Harbor Bay. I see colleagues over there in Discovery Bay. 
as well. I see researchers, I see students, I see educators, I see a few members from the National Environment and Planning Agency as well joining us this morning. If you, if you have just logged in, you are on NEPA's YouTube channel. And today we are looking at microplastics. We heard from Professor Mona Weber and we've just listened to Brandon here as he spoke to us on microplastics, a growing threat to our water birds. We have questions and the questions are coming from our YouTube channel. In fact, there has been a few this a, a few thoughts there from our YouTube channel. Yes, we have persons saying to us, what laws are being enacted to decrease plastic consumption? Are higher import tax placed on products stored in plastic? And I think I am gonna take that question, colleagues. Uh, here at the National Environment and Planning Agency, certainly through our Natural Resources Conservation Authority, NRCA Act, we have two plastic packaging material prohibition orders under the NRCA and Trade Acts. And these have been put in place to decrease plastic consumption and prevent the importation of certain types of plastics. So we saw that one coming to us from one of our guests on our YouTube platform. Of course, if you want to know more information about these laws, guess where you can find them? Right online. Visit us at www.nepa.gov.gm and you can have more information and the prohibition orders under the NRCA and Trade Acts. So let's see what other questions do we have. Are there incentives for manufacturers, importers, and consumers to use non-plastic items? Yes, there has been some amount of discussion where that is concerned. However, there is not a final, uh, nothing has been finalized in that regard, but there has been discussion within our government circles. Uh, we have a comment as well. I see jo jo John Donk. Ms. Donk is saying to us, grocery stores and shops, should repack should repackage food in paper bags and cease the use of plastic bags. Certainly, we heard from our presenters the individual responsibility which we have as we produce 1.5 kilogram per person each day in terms of our plastics. Let's go to those of our viewers who have joined us on or Zoom platform, and they have not asked us any questions. Um, let me go back to our YouTube channel and see what, are, what is our, our guests on our YouTube channel saying. Uh, we have Glamorous Graham, and she, she's asking, what do other countries in some parts of the world do about plastic ban? Is there anyone who wants to share with us? based on case studies from other countries? I'm sure, I, I think we, we are doing similar things. Um, the, the plastic bans that we started in Jamaica, if, if you go on the web, you will see several other Caribbean countries also um, have enacted these, these bans and globally. There, there, there are attempts to, to reduce the quantities of plastic that are being used and produced. When the COVID-19 pandemic hit, unfortunately, we saw reversal in some of these bans um, and packaging um, bans and, and containering of food that had started to become commonplace all over the world, reusable, 
um, plastic reusable bags, sorry, the, these were relaxed um, because of the fear of contamination during the pandemic. But I think the, the countries are realizing, they, they, as the minister mentioned, the pandemic exacerbates the whole issue of plastic um, um, production and use. And we have to maintain our efforts. We have to find ways of, of redoubling the efforts um, of, of containing our plastic use and, our, and the handling of the waste. So it, it is a global problem. And, and Jamaica is doing similar to what is happening all over the world. Indeed, a global trend of which we need to curb ourselves. I see our colleague from the Old Harbour Bay Fishermen's Cooperative encouraging more enforcement. She says there needs to be more enforcement as persons have gone back to plastic scandal bags. And for persons who may not remember what scandal bag is, it's the, the plastic, black plastic bag which most Jamaicans used, and it is, it is a single-use plastic bag, which was banned in 2018. So we have seen persons trying to bring that back in. Of course, at the agency, we've had several enforcement actions taken against persons since 2018. And our official folk is also saying to us, considering the magnitude of damage, we need to do much better. And I think that is the challenge that's the, the call to action that she's calling on all Jamaicans to ensure that we manage our, our individual solid waste um, much better, as well as a call onto all entities who are responsible. We need to recycle more and we need to, re of course, in where we have organic waste to ensure that we do our composting. Can you believe, ladies and gentlemen, that the hour has passed? We have been online for an hour having discussions here on NEPA's YouTube channel. NEPA Jamaica, we encourage you to like, subscribe, and share our information here. This has been the third in a series of presentations highlighting the problems and solutions in terms of our coastlines. And three weeks ago, we heard first what was happening in terms of pollution, um, how we were safeguarding our coastlines. Last week, we heard about the management of, of sargasm across the Caribbean region. And this week, we have just had a discussion with Professor Mona Weber of the University of the West Indies and Donovan Brandon Hay of the Portland by Protected area and Caribbean coastal air management. They spoke to us about microplastics and water birds. We wish for you to go out or you can go viewing. Tomorrow is uh, a movement day here in Jamaica. So you can view the water birds we have if you're in any coastal areas and do some bird watching. For those who have binoculars and like to view our wildlife, we certainly encourage all Jamaicans to manage our solid waste, use less plastics. We've learned it is getting into our food chain. We've learned of the health implications, but the wonderful news and commendations to the team led by Professor Mona Webb at the University of the West Indies is the restoration and the fact that our mangroves are coming back on Refuge Key. So I'm going to leave you this morning with a success story. Refuge Key, right there in the Kingston Harbor, Jamaica, the mangrove is actually returning to its natural state because in 2017, it was cleaned and over 800,000 PET bottles was removed from that area. We don't want it to go back to that state. So as Jamaicans, we have to manage our waste. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel, like, share, and comment at NEPA Jamaica. Have a fantastic day, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Thanks to our panel as well. Most welcome. Thank you. You're welcome.
拜。